Okay, good morning, folks. Um, and this is my first time using Zoom for this kind of a presentation, so uh, please bear with me if we have any technical issues. Uh, my name is Ann Udeloy. I'm a licensed hydrogeologist. Um, my uh, academic training is in geology and hydrogeology, and I have about 30 years experience working as a professional hydrogeologist in the state of Washington. Um, in that, I have installed literally thousands of wells across the state, and I have a pretty intimate knowledge of how groundwater and surface water work in much of the state. My focus has been on groundwater, um, surface water is in some ways a specialty area that I know um, a lot about, but I will not pretend to be an expert in it. Also, I am a hydrogeologist and not a lawyer. So I've got a pretty good understanding of regulations, but I'm not a lawyer and I'm not going to pretend to be a lawyer. Uh, I developed this presentation for our uh, Bellingham meeting. Uh, fortunately, some time has passed, and as a consequence, you now get a longer presentation. So with that, um, I'm going to start with recognizing that this is a really difficult topic to even find a beginning of. Uh, and, and that's because we're talking about water, and water is many things to many people, but water is life. And it's fundamental. If you do not have water, you will die. If you do not have access to water, clean, safe drinking water, you will die. You will pay anything for it because without it, you will die. And therefore, water is also power. Uh, water is also opportunity. If you want to grow crops in eastern Washington, you need water. Um, water is a key to prosperity. So water is many things to many people. Uh, and because of that, it becomes a very complicated topic very quickly. Uh, Washington's water resources are finite. They just are. There are only so many molecules of water to go around, and that is uh, really what we'll be talking about today. Um, climate change has already affected our water resources and will continue to affect these resources. I'm not going to be focusing on that, but that has to be the backdrop of everything we discuss. Uh, in addition, I think everybody recognizes when you have a finite resource and an increasing population, resource demands will increase and uh, arguments about resource allocation will also increase and get more vociferous. I'd like to point out that we are custodians of our resources and as custodians we have certain duties. Um, water supply is a civil rights issue. It simply is. Uh, water is also essential not just to us but also to our ecosystems. And if we permit water supply disruptions, we are also permitting ecosystem disruptions and these can and do lead to extinctions. Uh, there's a concept that has been with us for some hundreds of years called the tragedy of the commons. Uh, and the concept is that when a finite resource is shared by all the people with no one person being responsible, that individuals may, in pursuit of their own self-interest, um, try to use as much of that common as they can, and when many individuals do that, the commons itself can be depleted. Uh, it's called the tragedy of the commons, uh, and you've seen it in situations like overfishing, overgrazing. Uh, it can and does occur, and I it is happening now with our water resource. From, if we assume we have a duty as a resource custodian, then part of that duty is to pass our resources on to future generations in at least an equal condition, if not an improved condition, uh, and not in a diminished condition. So to me, all this adds up to uh, our needing as, as a people a means for managing our increasingly scarce water resources. Uh, I'm a scientist, so I believe this should be a science-based and transparent and effective process. And I also uh, believe in small d democracy, which means that we the people can create a government of by and for us, and that government should give us the means for providing that fair and transparent science-based process for water resource allocation and management.
So now I'm going to take on our new in gross substitute Senate Bill 6091 and look at it from the perspective of whether it supports those goals. In our presentation today, we're going to be covering some basic background materials because I don't know all of your backgrounds. So I'd just like to get us on the same page with some basic language and um, ideas. We'll be looking at in-stream flows, uh, which were most recently uh, affected by a court case called the Foster decision. We're gonna look at exempt groundwater wells, which were recently affected by a court case called the Hearst decision. And we're gonna look at our new legislation. I'm also gonna give you some closing thoughts at the end. I'm going to point out, this is an informational presentation. This is not intended as legal advice. I am not a lawyer. Uh, and this is my point of view. Uh, it does not represent the official position of the 46th District Democrats, the Democratic Party, any other group I'm affiliated with. These are my thoughts and mine alone, and you're free to argue with them as you see fit. So I'm just going to remind everybody, surface water is pretty much what it says on the box. If you can see water on the ground surface, that is surface water whether it's a puddle after a rainstorm or the ocean itself. Uh, groundwater is water that you cannot see at the ground surface. It's underneath the ground surface. And in Washington state, it's pretty much everywhere. Uh, you drill a hole in the ground almost anywhere in the state and you will encounter saturated soils. Um, the picture shown on the screen here is actually the Skagit River area, and you can see surface water in the background. Anywhere you poke a hole in the ground, you're going to encounter groundwater. And in a situation like this, it's really obvious that the groundwater and the surface water are in fact one in the same. Uh, this concept is called hydraulic continuity, groundwater and surface water being a single continuous system. A couple other terms you need to know, in-stream flow is the amount of water that is in the stream. Uh, in some cases, for some streams, ecology has set minimum in-stream flow requirements, and we'll discuss that in a fair amount of detail as we move forward. Uh, ecology, uh, as a quick reminder, it refers to the Washington State Department of Ecology, and that is the administrative branch of our government in the state that uh, enforces and uh, evaluates uh, our resources. So think of the EPA at a state level, that's the Department of Ecology. Um, a water resource inventory area, or RIA, is a geographic unit. It includes at least one basin or watershed, and we have quite a few of them, and I'm going to move into that right now. These are the rias for the state of Washington. These were first identified in 1976. And if you look at the map, you'll realize that these are basically uh, topographic uh, areas. The, they were established to look at surface water drainages. These do not necessarily correspond to aquifers. For example, if we go over to Eastern Washington, we have aquifers that underlie dozens of rias. In other areas, the aquifers uh, may extend across only a couple of rias, and in some cases, an aquifer will be entirely within a single raya. A couple things I wanna point out here. If you look up in the upper left corner of this area at the Elwood Dungeness area, raya 18, you'll see that there are in-stream flow rules for a portion of a raya, but not the entire raya. You'll see the same thing up here in raya three, the lower Skagit Samish raya. There are in-stream flow rules for much of it, but not all of it. Uh, then there are areas over in the uh, right-hand side of the screen in the middle Spokane area. You'll see that there are in-stream flow rules that extend across several rias uh, and uh, basically do not constrain themselves to RIA boundaries. We're going to come back to this concept of in-stream flows. Um, I'm just going to mention in passing that these areas are where in-stream flow rules have been established. 
all everything except these green areas, we never actually did establish rules in those. But the other areas, the ones shown in orange or blue gray or yellow, these are areas where in-stream flow rules have already been established. And what that means is water resources in those areas are already under great stress. You'll notice that's about half the state. Again, just getting us all on the same page, this is the water cycle. And I think everybody probably remembers a version of this from some time in their academic background. Um, rain falls, uh, it can land as rain or snow or what have you. Uh, in, in our area, we get a lot of rain up in the mountains for orographic effects. Uh, the rain can either soak into the ground or run off. Uh, water collects in streams and rivers but it also collects in the underlying soil. So if we get over, if you look at the uh, cutout part, portion of this, you'll see that you have rivers and streams. In this case, the water in those rivers and streams is soaking into the ground and recharging groundwater. In other areas, you'll find that the groundwater actually discharges to rivers and streams. So if you were to look at an area such as the Nisqually Delta, that's an area where groundwater is actively discharging from the rivers into the delta region. And finally, of course, both surface water and groundwater discharge to Puget Sound. Uh, you can see a couple of illustrations of wells in this area. We're going to talk about wells a fair amount for a little while here. Wells are basically holes in the ground that let us get to water easily. Uh, the main point I want to remind you of here is that groundwater and surface water are really a single system in most areas. There are occasionally areas where surface water and groundwater are not hydraulically continuous, but those are few and far between when you come down to it. Quick review, what is a well? Uh, we build wells by using often a steel tube we push that tube into the ground through any number of means. We push it down through any overlying dry or damp soils and then into wet soils. We take all the soil out from inside that tube and then we can either install another device into that uh, cylindrical hole in the ground and pull out our original steel tube and expose the other device, the well. Or we can just leave that first tube in the ground, cut slots in it, and let water flow in. And in a lot of cases, uh, for instance, over in the east side in bedrock uh, aquifers, you'll find that people don't even poke holes in the steel tube. They literally just drive a steel tube down into the basalt hundreds and hundreds of feet and leave an open tube in the bottom, and water will flow up into that tube. Then you hang a pump below the water level and you can pump the water out to ground surface. Um, it all sounds really complicated. I think the thing I want to call your attention to is this is what, it, this is what the finished product looks like. It looks really innocuous. Um, and what you see here is a security casing that protects the well. The well is inside this and all the action is below ground surface. You don't see any of it. If you're in rural areas or if this is somebody's household water supply well, the well itself will often be inside a small building. And that allows, it not only protects the well, but allows you to get at the pump and the accoutrements uh, so that you, you can easily access your water supply system. So we're gonna shift gears now. Uh, that's a quick background on how water works. Uh, and now we're going to talk a little bit about treaties and laws and regulations. Oh, my. Uh, I would argue that regulation of water in the state of Washington began when the first treaties were signed. Uh, there are what are called the eight treaties. They were signed between 1854 and 1856. And the first of these was the Treaty of Medicine Creek. But all of these treaties have similar language. So, um, the first thing I want to call to everyone's attention, and we need to come back to this because I think in a lot of ways our, our treaties are misunderstood at a, a pretty profound level. A treaty is not 
a grant of rights to the tribes. When the treaties were signed, there were many members of tribes and not very many European settlers, less than 2,000. The treaties were grants of rights from the tribes to European settlers. They were grants from the powerful to those who were asking for opportunity. They are very gracious documents in which the tribes granted certain privileges to European settlers and the United States government, but they retained to their own nations rights. Among the rights that the tribes reserved are the absolute rights to fish at their usual and accustomed fishing grounds and stations. That, that language is common to all of the eight treaties. So over the years, um, the treaty rights were often abrogated and uh, the tribes had to go to court to sue for enforcement of their rights and the courts have not only reconfirmed that the treaties were grants of rights from the tribes to, your, to the US government and uh, citizens, but also that in reserving land under these treaties, the government also reserved water necessary to fulfill the purposes of those reserved lands. I, I would also remind you the reserved lands are the lands that the tribes reserve full rights to. There are no US government rights on the lands that the tribes reserved for themselves. The courts have also determined for the treaties to be meaningful, fish must actually exist at those usual and accustomed fishing grounds and stations. Therefore, the federal and state governments have a duty to protect the habitat of those fishing grounds. As a consequence of all this, minimum in-stream flows are required to sustain fisheries under these treaties. Now, um, from my personal per perspective, thank goodness for this, because without this, um, without these requirements, uh, our water resources would be in far worse shape today. And we really have the tribes to thank for our water resources being in as good condition as they are uh, as we see them now. So uh, this map is from our Washington State Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife. This is the only map that I could find that would give you an idea of where these eight treaties actually apply. I do not believe that this represents what the tribes would interpret. Uh, it may, but I leave open the question that it may not. It is not from the tribes and therefore does not represent their interpretation. I present this to you just to give you an idea of where these treaty rights apply. And that's more than half the state. So now a uh, really fast, but unfortunately very wordy discussion of water law. Uh, just to remind you of the time frame. You know, we had uh, Lewis and Clark out here in the early 1800s. Then we have the 1854 to 1856, the eight treaties were signed. By 1917, we enacted our first state water code. Uh, I want to point out that when we enacted the water code, the Yakima River had already been overappropriated. In 1945, we enacted our first groundwater regulations. In 1971, we recognized that these weren't working very well, and we implemented what's called the Water Resources Act. That is where those rias came from. Uh, we, at in the 70s, as a state, started to look at um, how we should manage water resources, surface and groundwater resources collectively, and we implemented a watershed-based management program. In the 1980s, that led to the first in-stream flow regulations, even though depleted in-stream flows had been apparent for years, and the tribes were working hard to enforce their treaty rights during this time. So our water code states, our water resources belong collectively to the public. What this means is that no one person ever owns water in the state of Washington. Instead, the state grants a person or group of people the rights to put water to beneficial use. What this means is that every drop of water you use, when you turn on your tap, 
someone somewhere along the line had a right to put the water into the system for you. If you are in the city of Seattle, uh, you know, my water comes from the city of Seattle water supply. The city of Seattle has a right to water in the Chester Morris Reservoir. If you are living on a rural piece of property and your water is coming out of your well, you have a right to that water. Uh, irrigator, it, irrigators over on the east side must have rights to divert surface or groundwater. The tribes have rights, not only under their treaties, but they also have additional rights that they have claimed under the, the water code. Every drop of water is provided, unless it's fallen out of the sky as precipitation, you got it by having a right to it. In Washington state, we use what's called the prior appropriation doctrine. So we use a first in time, first in right principle, recognizing that the treaties have primacy. Those come first among all. I'm not gonna discuss the sidebar, but if you, if you have time to go back and look at this, yeah, I'd point out all laws are political, and uh, we have many situations in which laws that affect civil rights have changed over time. Uh, if you look at laws, uh, the, the Jim Crow laws, they enforced a, a very arrogant political uh, framework and have been overturned. So when you look at our water laws, there's a fair amount of arrogance and bias in there. Uh, they're, they're, is an inherent racism to our water law. And uh, all these laws have been written and enforced by humans. We're, we're frail. Uh, we bring our biases. Uh, and as we get into this, I'm going to uh, point out that our laws and regulations are internally co contradictory and sometimes mandate the impossible. One of the things this leads to is we have a situation today where we have finite resources, competing interests, competing visions, and increasing demand, all of which lead to ongoing controversy. And all of this on top of a backdrop of our treaties. So we are always trying to balance the relative importance of municipal water supplies and agriculture, uh, hydropower generation and ecosystems. Uh, what are the roles and rights of all of our major entities from the tribes and the federal government through private citizens? How are we going to balance environmental integrity with economic opportunity? Um, the rights of people who already have their certified water right or their need and the opportunities for future development. What will be the rights of people who come to the state in 10 years? And we are always, always arguing about what's in the public interest and what's in the private interest. So now we'll move into the main thesis of our talk, and that is um, the discussion of exempt wells and how this has recently been changed by legislation. So starting with the 1945 rules, our groundwater regulations have permitted certain wells to be exempted from permit requirements. And what this means is any citizen of the state could install these wells on land they legally own for these purposes without filing for a water right. They were assumed to have a right to install this well, not assumed to have the right to it, but they could install the well and use the water and they were not required to file a water right although they could if they chose to they could file for a water right for this water i'm going to draw your attention to the first two permitted uses because those will be a big focus for today and that is for any single home or group of homes that produce where the well produces 5,000 gallons per day at a maximum um, I'm going to note 100 gallons a day per person is a reasonable consumption rate. So this is a supply for 50 people. Uh, you also have, under the 1945 rules, the right to install an additional or separate well for a non-commercial lawn or garden. Watering a non-commercial lawn or garden, the garden has to be one half acre size or less, but you can take all the water you want for that. You also have a 5,000 gallon a day opportunity for industrial purposes. And that purpose can be, for instance, a greenhouse, 
Uh, it can be a small shop. Um, it can be a, a, a small uh, herd of cattle, except if you were actually raising livestock, you would go with the stock watering exemption, which gives you unlimited use. This was tested um, really within the last few years when a stock watering permit was put to use for a 30,000 herd head or head herd of cattle. And the stock watering, the unlimited exemption for stock watering use was upheld by the state Supreme Court. So this whole concept of allowing these four uses under our groundwater rules has been debated for really since, since it was enacted. Um, is it a feature? It, it's actually great because any individual in the state can go uh, buy their little piece of heaven, poke a hole in the ground, have a well, and know that they can support their household and garden. And this is especially important when we're trying to settle uh, rural areas because extending municipal water supply pipes is, is just cost prohibitive. You just can't do it. So if you are going to develop rural areas, if, if people are going to live in these areas, they need to be able to use wells. Uh, and, and I would point out tens of thousands of these exempt wells already exist. And of those tens and thousands, very, very few have certified water rights. The problem is that tens of thousands of these wells exist and more are going in every day. Uh, in addition, there's no requirement for metering these wells. We don't know how much water is being used. Uh, we have no way of finding out. Uh, and yeah, there's a filing system. Uh, people are supposed to file a water well report. The, the driller who installs the well is supposed to file the water well report. But a lot of those water well reports are imperfect. Uh, the, the well is incorrectly located. Um, the address given is the address in town where the person lived before they built their house and moved out to the property where the well is. Sometimes it's a post office box. Um, I have gone through many areas where I have gone door to door and been unable to find a water well record for wells that exist and uh, found that the water well report that I have in my hand is for a well that's in, you know, miles away from where I'm, I'm doing my research. We also know that exempt wells already impact in-stream flows and senior water rights. This is just true. Uh, we know it to be true. And that's going to be uh, a focus of our talk for the rest of today. So uh, I come back to my original question uh, about what's a fair and transparent science-based process for water resource allocation and management, and how do exempt wells fit into that? The Hearst decision. We're going to start with the fact, as I mentioned, in, in 1905, the Yakima River had already been over allocated. Um, since the 1960s, development in rural areas has routinely been impacted by limited water supplies. This situation got worse in the 70s, which led to implementation of uh, the, the water resource management programs and the RIAs were defined. Uh, and Throughout the 80s, minimum in-stream flows were identified in many of the RIAs, more than half, of, almost half of them. And then in October 2016, uh, the state Supreme Court decided uh, the Hearst case. This was a case where a developer planned to um, build a number of houses and rely on exempt wells to supp supply the water supplies. Under state law, the county government is required to confirm that there's water supply before it issues a building permit. The case before the court was a claim that those exempt wells would impact senior water rights, either groundwater or surface water rights that already existed, and that before the building permits were issued, the local government had to confirm that water was already available and if it couldn't confirm that the exempt wells would not impact senior rights, they should not issue the building permits. This was run through the building permit approach because ecology had been relying on what they called their Nooksuk rule, which presumed that adequate supply would be available for any exempt well, and therefore the wells could be installed. And uh, the case before the court was basically saying that the, the counties couldn't rely on e ecology's exemptions. 
the Supreme Court agreed and said it was the county government's responsibility to prove, to demonstrate that there was an adequate supply before permitting the building. This had statewide implications. Um, the first and foremost was it was saying that the counties couldn't rely on what ecology was holding to be true. They had to independently come to a decision. Uh, obviously, if you can't issue a building permit until you prove that there's a water supply, um, that means you can't issue building permits. And the counties responded by saying that they did not have in-house expertise to figure out whether there was an adequate supply, and they certainly didn't have the money to hire anyone to do that. Uh, in some counties, not very many, um, this did effectively stop housing construction and occupancy for homes that relied on exempt wells. Uh, obviously, this, this caused a great amount of distress, especially in rural areas. And in June 19, uh, 2017, uh, the operating budget was passed by the state legislature, but the capital budget negotiations failed. Uh, Republican legislators basically said um, that they would not vote for the capital budget unless Senate Bill 5239, which was even worse than what was finally passed, uh, was agreed. Democrats held firm and said that they will would not approve uh, SB 5239. Negotiations failed and the legislature adjourned without passing a capital budget, which means that uh, for the next six months, we were not building schools, we were not repairing roads and bridges, we were not doing all those good things that we normally do when we have a functional state government. So in January 2018, uh, the Senate Bill 6091 was proposed, amended, and the amended version was passed by the Senate two to one margin, the House two to one margin, signed by the governor effective January 19th, the same day the capital budget was passed. So this was a negotiation. This uh, 6091 is effectively uh, the trade for passing the capital budget and is called the Hearst Fix. So what did it do? Well, um, graphically, if we look at the situation in the state before Hearst, you can see that Hearst equivalent rules actually already applied to about a quarter of the land area of the state. So in these two areas, uh, in the left-hand pie chart, the upper two areas, about 13 to 14% each, uh, already had watershed rules that said that exempt wells could not impair senior rights or in-stream flows. So that, that's what Hearst was saying. You, know, you had to prove the water was there before you could put in an exempt well. That's what already applied in those watersheds. In an additional 21%, this, this green quarter over on the left-hand side of the pie, in those areas, there were already administrative in-stream flow requirements, but there was no explicit regulatory provision saying that you had to demonstrate adequate supply before you could install an in-stream or an exempt well. So in that 21%, there was already a, a provision to, to maintain in-stream flows, but there wasn't a specific focus on exempt wells. For the rest of the state, this was still run under the 1945 groundwater laws. You could install any exempt well for any of those four purposes. All you had to do is file your water well report. Hearst changed this by taking the rules that applied to this first quarter of the state and extending it statewide. Now, you know, the, the good news is this is actually a really simple regulatory approach. The bad news is there were no detailed studies in place that would allow it to be easily administered in a short period of time, except in that original quarter of the state where the rules were already applied. And potentially this other 20% where we already understood in-stream flow requirements and had done some pretty detailed watershed studies, we just needed to look at the exact role of exempt wells. But we had nothing in place for half the state, nothing at all. So uh, it was simple, but kind of hard to administer for certainly half the state. Under the Hearst fix, we now have uh, you know, this, this original group 
where Hearst rules effectively already applied, you know, really, they weren't changed under Hearst. They started in that condition, they stayed in that condition, and they still stay in that condition. For the rest of the state, we now have some new rules. And um, you'll note that I, I thought this was pretty simple. So let's look at our new rules and how simple they are. There they go. You start with asking whether or not you've got in-stream flows regulated. Are exempt wells already regulated? That set of sites are these guys up here. These are the fellas that already have regulations in place. And you'll see if you come down that part of the flow, our new Senate rules change, our new, our new rules change nothing. However, we've got some pretty big changes for the rest of the state. This group up here uh, at the top of the chart uh, it, that's regulated now under section 101G, all exempt wells are permitted. All you have to do is file your water well report. There are no planning requirements and there's no plan for developing any. So these guys are just kind of sent to go do. Under sections 202 and 203, we have uh, exempt wells permitted. They are permitted to impact in-stream flows. And in each of these areas, we get committees that will make plans to mitigate that. So looking at this in, in some detail, again, these are the fellows who were already under Hearst-like rules, and they remain under Hearst-like rules, these guys down here. This big group, the section um, 101G group up here, all existing exempt wells are grandparented. New wells can impact in-stream flows, close water bodies, one big change, the counties can no longer look at where the proposed well is going in and say, hey, you know, that's awfully close to an existing water supply system. You need to hook up to the existing system. Uh, counties can no longer require that. that. That has now been dropped. And counties must accept a water well report as proof of water availability. So this rule reverts all authority back to ecology. Under sections 202, which is this group here, uh, all existing wells are grandparented. New exempt wells can impact closed water bodies and impair in-stream flows. But there is a planning process that's being developed. These are areas where there are already watershed plans, complete watershed plans. And in this area, the um, parties involved in that planning get to set up a committee and they have to explain how they're going to mitigate. They, they know that these new exempt wells are going to impair in-stream flows, and these committees have to figure out how to mitigate that. Hey, Ann. Is yes. Good? Can I interrupt for a second? We're sure. having a hard time seeing your cursor because it's white against a white background. So when I'm you sorry. To the chart, no, no worries. Would you refer to the chart to say where on the chart you're talking about? Thank you. I will. So I'm looking at the three red blocks in the upper red hand corner and I'm now at the third one where it says regulate section 203. Um, regulate under section 203. These are watersheds where we have in-stream flow requirements. We do not have any regulation of exempt wells previously and we don't have any complete watershed plans. Uh, these under this section, each RIA will be required to commit to create a committee. The committee has to come up with a plan for mitigating exempt wells. So they have to allow exempt wells. The exempt wells can impact in closed water bodies. They can impair in-stream flows. They can impact senior water rights. And these committees in these RIAs will have to figure out how to mitigate that without having control over where the wells are going, how many there will be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there is also no timetable for when they do this under section 203. 
Under Section 202, there are pretty rigorous timetables. Um, under Section 203, there are not. Under Section 202 and 203, um, there's supposed to be a, a stick provision. And the stick in each of these was to limit the production capacity for exempt wells until plans are adopted. So if you want to lift that limit, you have to adopt your plan. And I guess that was considered to be a, a real motivating factor to get folks up and running to uh, fix the situation, develop plans and make sure everything was going to be fine. The problem is when you look at those limits under Section 202, um, new exempt wells for domestic use are limited to 3,000 gallons a day. That's a small household of 30 people. Uh, under Section 203, the limit is, is more strict. It's 950 gallons a day. Again, that that's ample supply for a household of nine. So I would argue that this is a along the lines of, of setting you down to a dinner table and saying, you know, originally you were going to be allowed the opportunity to eat 50 gallons of kale. And we're now going to limit you to only eating 30 gallons of kale. And you're sitting there going, you know, if I eat a quart of kale, I'm going to be fine. <laughs> so, so these aren't actually really big limits. Um, the other thing, and I think this was a simple goof. The regulations limit production for new exempt wells for domestic use and then explicitly exempt regulation of the other exempt well uses. So what this means is here, are, if, if we go to the current rules for exempt uses, we have industrial uses, 5,000 gallons a day, irrigation of a lawn or non-commercial garden of a half acre or less in size with unlimited use, stock water with unlimited use. So I called a couple of legislative aides and I called ecology and it's very clear that everyone at the table intended to not regulate stock water use or industrial use. And they seem to have kind of forgotten about that irrigation of the lawn or garden exemption. Um, it's an unlimited use and it, it remains unrestricted. Now, in my peregrations around the state uh, as a hydrogeologist, there are plenty of places right now in rural areas where you'll go up to a household where there's, there's a house with its own domestic water supply well, and then there's a pretty large garden. Half acre garden is a pretty big garden and it's separate from the house and it has its own water supply well because that well is only used part of the year. It can produce an unlimited amount, whatever you need for that garden. And it made more sense to put in a separate well for that garden that's distant from the house that you only use a couple months of the year and that you produce a lot more water from than it was to build a really big domestic supply well and um, have that capacity available all year long. It, it's easier to run a power drop than it is to run pipes. So a lot of people already do this. And I explicitly asked, why would anyone not do this? If, you know, if, if I'm in an area where my domestic use is limited to 950 gallons a day, great, I put one well in for that, another $5,000, and I've got a second well for my lawn or garden. And the ecology representative said, Ecology is directing the counties that domestic use is interpreted as including outdoor use. So we meant for that to include your lawn or garden. That's never going to fly. Uh, there's already very recent settled case law that will um, just shut that down. It's, it's at the level of, really, that's what you're choosing to go with? Um, it will never fly. So. Yeah, you know, we circle back. If, if we're looking for a fair and transparent science-based process for water resource allocation and management, uh, I, I, this new rule um, doesn't seem to be moving us in the right direction. So, sorry. Um, want to talk a little bit about in-stream flows. Um, these were most recently addressed by the Foster decision. 
Um, and this is a pretty complicated decision. Uh, the city of Yelm wanted to use uh, more water to support future growth. And ecology, after about two decades of negotiations with lots of parties, came up with its um, really its, its best possible plan that would provide additional water for the city of Yelm and mitigate the impacts of providing that water. But the best they could do impaired in-stream flows during shoulder months in spring and fall. And what ecology said is, yeah, but look at all the mitigation we're doing, we're improving habitat, we're doing all this great stuff. And so on balance, this is actually better for all parties and therefore we can impair in-stream flows for small periods in the spring and fall because on balance, everything is great. And they relied on a clause in the Water Resources Act of 1971 that allows ecology to withdraw water that would otherwise be appropriated to others where there's an overriding consideration of the public interest. So ecology's permit was appealed by a person named Foster. It went to the state Supreme Court and the state Supreme Court um, was, was actually a little caustic in their opinion uh, and uh, said the prior appropriation doctrine does not permit even de minimis impairments of senior water rights and that the overriding consideration of public interest exception is not an end run around the appropriation process. This whole decision turned on this, the question of what the word withdrawal means. Uh, the, the Supreme Court was holding that withdrawal meant something that was short-term and not permanent. If the legislator had meant a permanent withdrawal, they would have used the word appropriate. They didn't use the word appropriate. Therefore, something that will permanently impact senior water rights is impermissible under the prior appropriation doctrine, and the OCPI exemption cannot be used to support it. Uh, Ecology was hoping they could use uh, this exemption as a balancing tool. Uh, the decision says they can't. This was um, actually one of the things that we started to address with this new legislation, which is a very important point. So we're circling back to that. But I want to point out, first, let's look at where our new rules apply. All these areas that are shown in gray and yellow, these are unaffected by the new rules. These are places where hearse like rules already applied and still apply. And you can see that's about a quarter of the land area of the state. All these areas shown in white are the areas where Hearst has been eliminated entirely. This is where you go back to the 1945 standards. All exempt wells are permitted. All uses of exempt wells are permitted. Really the change here is that um, municipalities can't say, hey, it looks like you're awfully close to that existing water supply system. We're gonna ask you to tie into that water supply system. Uh, city, city and, and county governments can no longer ask that as a condition of a building permit. But otherwise, so it's, it's actually the same as it was in 1945, except maybe a little worse. <laughs> it's, uh, the cities and counties have a little less authority. Uh, the real changes are these areas that are shown in green and pink. The areas shown in green are the ones where you have the 950 gallon a day limit for exempt wells and you do not have any watershed planning process um, right now. There's no complete watershed plan. So they're gonna be in the new committees and there's no timetable for completing watershed planning. The areas shown in red and pink uh, are areas where there uh, is an existing watershed plan and the interested parties are going to be pulled back together and asked to update their plans within specific time frames, uh, 2019 to 2021. And again, in all these green, red, and pink areas, the new rules say that the watershed plans have to figure out how to mitigate for exempt wells 
knowing that they're going to be there, knowing that we're not going to regulate them, and knowing that they will impact senior rights and in-stream flows. So trying to bring the circle together here, the new rules reinstate ecology as the lead agency. Uh, this was one of the, the concerns of the Hearst decision uh, that the county governments were being asked to identify the adequacy of water supply. This puts ecology back in the driver's seat. This says that ecology um, is the group that makes those decisions and county governments can rely on ecology's decisions. Um, this is actually something county governments had been asking for. They don't want to make these decisions. They want to be able to rely on ecology. It, went, it goes further by eliminating the potential for county and municipal governments to ever serve that function. Uh, it says, no, we're, we're basically stripping your authority to, to question uh, anything, including this issue of whether or not you can put your um, uh, require hookups to existing systems. For about three quarters of the state, for everything that was not already under Hearst-like rules, we are now permitting exempt wells to impair minimum flows and senior rights. That's a big change. Um, there are going to be five pilot projects. It appears that these five pilot projects are designed to implement some form of mitigation measures that will not fully address minimum flow impairments. So this is the sort of thing that the City of Yelm project was trying to do uh, and that the Supreme Court said, no, you're not allowed to do that. So it, it looks like we've got five pilot projects that are explicitly authorized by the legislature to do something that the Supreme Court said, no, you're not allowed to do that. However, the legislature did not actually go in and change the word withdraw to, meet, to appropriate or otherwise redefine what they meant by the word withdraw in that exemption for overriding considerations of the public interest. So again, um, there's that question of whether we're moving towards a fair and transparent science-based process, but there's also now a question of, you know, is this actually consistent with our treaties? Is this actually consistent with the prior appropriation doctrine? So, Anne? Yeah. We're at 9.57. Okay. Um, quickly, there's good news. We've got a capital budget. And people can go forward and build homes. This is all a good thing. Um, we got 20 million bond capacity actually authorized under the current capital budget. And we've got a lot of studies that will be made. But we also have a lot of unresolved dilemmas. Uh, we only have planning proposed in areas where in-stream flows are already under pressure. There's no planning proposed for 50% of the state in which we never had planning to begin with. Um, there are a lot of legislative issues that remain untouched, like the overriding consideration of public interest, like the question of whether exempt wells actually still make sense, or what we do about those unlimited stock watering and lawn watering provisions. Um, I'm going to move forward a little quickly, point out that there are a lot of political issues here. Um, the, the Republicans effectively won the hostage crisis. They delivered on their pledge to reverse Hearst. This, this legislation does. I don't think they meant to do, I think the Democrats didn't understand how completely they were reversing Hearst. Um, but they, this does reverse Hearst state, statewide. Um, and it gives the Republicans a lot of good talking points, especially in rural areas. The Democrats, on the other hand, have some good talking points too. They got a capital budget passed early in the session, which allowed them to do a lot of good things. Um, and if you ask any, I've talked to a lot of people about in, in our area about this. Everyone talks about the budget. Nobody talks about water. So the implications on water have not been thought through or discussed broadly in our community. Uh, for me, one of the things that I always worry about is the duration of a, a politician or manager's career is actually very short. It's usually uh, a matter of years, possibly decades. Consequences of these decisions go on for decades, centuries, even thousands of years. 
And I think that's the situation we're in right now. So I, I need to ask, are we on a good path? We have finite resources. Our resources are under increasing pressure. From my perspective, this new legislation just kicks the can down the road and doesn't affect the fact that the tragedy of the commons is actually already happening. Uh, future generations will not be happy if we do nothing more at this point in time. What do we do next? Right now we have a system where water resource management is crisis management. We manage resources only when all of a sudden we realize there's not enough resource out there. We have the rules on the books already. The Water Resources Act of 1971 permits us to do the proper evaluations. It's never been properly implemented, it's never been properly funded, and it's never been extended to most, you know, more than half the state. Where we have actually done evaluations, we show we don't have enough water for everybody. There are also a lot of major technical issues. We, we don't quantify our water resources effectively. We don't monitor those resources effectively. Um, we don't know where hydraulic continuity is and is not relevant. We don't know if these new proposals for out of kind, out of time mitigation are a responsible management tool or a charlatan's shell game. Uh, the five pilot projects may give us insights into that. I just want to point out to you that if you don't have enough molecules to share, performing a shell game with those molecules to make it appear that you will someday isn't actually going to fix your problem. And one thing nobody's actually got around to is uh, we actually haven't processed water rights since about the 1980s, and there are hundreds and hundreds on file that have been applied for and never processed. So closing thoughts. Water is not just a final uh, finite resource, it's a civil right. It's essential for our ability to live. Therefore, all of these are moral issues. And under our law, the water resources collectively belong to the public. They're not being well managed right now. Every time this goes to court, the court says, hey, you know, you've got rules on the books. You should follow those rules. And yet we don't. We don't, we don't, we don't, and we have to do court case after court case, and the court keeps saying, hey, you know, you got rules on the books, you should follow the rules. The, I think one of the problems is Democrats and Republicans alike want to say, it's fine. Everybody would like to believe it's fine. There are no limits. There is no bad news. I just don't think that these new rules are helping us at all, and I think as a group, what we need to do is elevate the conversation uh, and demand more from our legislators. Uh, instead of trying to create complex shell games, we should quantify our resources and manage our resources and live within our means. So thank you all. And with that.